Today's episode is brought to you by Media for All, which was set up to help encourage more black, Asian and other ethnic talent into media and to provide a support and mentoring network to ensure talent flourishes in the media industry that we all love. If you're looking for a mentor or would like to mentor young ethnic talent, check them out at mediaforall.org.uk and it is all 100% free. Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative and this is a weekly podcast where I have the pleasure and the privilege of interviewing one of our industry's leaders and this week is no different. I'm on a call with Rebecca Dib Simkin who is Global Director of Products and Marketing at Octopus Energy Group. Rebecca, for anyone listening to this podcast who doesn't know who you are or what you do, could you give them an overview? Hello, and thanks for having me on. Um, I look after all product development, uh, marketing and comms for Octopus Energy Group, which is known in the UK as a, um, an energy retailer. So a bit like British Gas, but with fewer customers, got about 3 million in the UK. Um, we're in 13 different countries uh, around the world, both generating um, energy, so solar, wind turbines, and also selling that energy directly to end customers. And what were you doing before that role? Um, well, I've, I've kind of, I've worked in marketing, um, for all of my career. Now I wasn't going to be marketing. I actually wanted to be an accountant. So, um, when I was at uni, did a, did a business degree, had uh, jobs lined up with two of the, two of the big four. Um, and then I read on the back of my student union magazine after I just accepted the, <laughs> one of these jobs, actually, um, a brilliant long copy ad um, about a, a graduate scheme at Ogilvy Group, at the advertising agency written by Rory Sutherland, who's a bit of a god um, of copy and uh, yeah, promoting their graduate scheme. And I was so captivated by the, the story which he wove about what it would be like to work for a company like that and, you know, create content, and create comms, which would engage with people that I applied myself and ended up not being an accountant in Nottingham um, and working in advertising um, in London, which was, which was fabulous, actually. We kind of had six weeks training on this, this graduate scheme where we did loads of cool stuff and met all the most important people. And then we got put on accounts um, and had a big shot when basically you kind of spend the next six months doing the photocopying. Um, but um, yeah, incredible. And over the, the, the next 18 months, um, got experience around the business and then actually ended up moving to um, British Gas, um, who was one of our clients, and I worked in new business and managed the pitch for the direct mail uh, British Gas business back in 2007, um, and then got sent over onto Commons um, to work for British Gas, replacing an account manager who was already there, which I was terribly miffed about because it's um, quite different going from trendy advertising agency in London with a bar in the office to British Gas in Slough, um, you know, and even having to kind of buy new work uniform and all that kind of thing. But I actually really found myself enjoying that business, um, worked for um, we sponsored the British Swimming Association during the Olympics um, so I was seconded over to them to, to run some of their marketing um, I had a team um, in another role there based all over the UK and in India so I went out to India a few times was working on comms out there so it was really really interesting uh, place to work and move around but actually I started to get more and more frustrated while I was there um, about what being a marketer was so again going back to I wanted to be an accountant because I like numbers and the way they balance and the way they make sense um, and then was literally captivated by copy to pull into being a marketer but sometimes being a marketer is a bit rubbish because you sometimes get given a crap product to go and promote and people go oh Rebecca if you could just put you know this in the tv ad then loads of people will buy and I just like I just don't think that's that's the right way to you know that that doesn't always work so I wanted to, a role where actually I would be building the product as well as selling it because I think those two things go hand in hand um so I, I moved to their hive business which is their internet of things business and actually started building stuff moved into a head of product role and actually built their hive thermostat so it was designed manufactured work with the, the Chinese manufacturer was in China a lot and then rolled it out to, to customers who so did all that side of it and then when I moved to my current business, Octopus, which was a very small business at that point, I was about employee number 40. There were 50,000 customers to look after all marketing and product and kind of grown it since then. So I am an unusual marketer in that I didn't want to be a marketer. Don't really like marketing very much, but seem to be fairly <laughs> OK at it. So there we go. It's a monologue of my career over the last 15 years. <laughs> You're the first 
product and marketing person. I, I think I'm maybe maybe slightly wrong on that. But so how does that work? So yes, you're right. Your product usually give the product to marketing and say, you know, make this look nice and make people buy it. Like, mm. how, I mean, is that a 50-50 split? How does that work? Are you ideating with technologists with a you know always having a marketing brain on in the background and then that kicks in at a certain point? Just I have no idea how, how that works at a, a company like Octopus. Well, I don't I mean I don't really know how, how it works if you don't do it that way. I mean, I my, my favorite marketing phrase um, by a chap called Peter Jocker is the aim of marketing is to make selling superfluous. So you create such an awesome thing that people want that thing, and all you're doing is smoothing the channels of communication to people knowing about that thing. It, you know, it all goes hand in hand. So octopus, um, I suppose my primary role is you know people is selling energy to to humans um and so it's thinking about um how do you make that process as simple as possible for people to take that product how do you make that product interesting so we have different kinds of tariffs if people want an interesting you know techie smart tariff or if they don't want a techie smart tariff and they just want it as cheap as possible with awesome customer service then how do you put that together to them and how do you communicate it and then when they're a customer with you how do you make that experience as frictionless as possible um now i do so i suppose you know everything i do it's it, it, i don't separate it it's like how do we create this product and how do we get it out there and the way that we do marketing at, marketing and product to octopus um it's slightly different so we do all of our creative and all of our build in house we're, we're a tech business actually we're not just an energy company we think of ourselves as tech business first so all of our development is done in house and the front end development team has always kind of had a dotted line into me as it was so if i needed anything created it could just be created so everything's done in house uh, we have four designers who create everything that you'll see octopus whether that's a tv ad whether that's designing an app um whether that's you know emails whatever that that is and we have developers who build it so actually it's a very seamless the way we do things is about you know yeah creating that thing for a customer and getting it to them and we don't start splitting it into product or marketing so across that career and in this new exciting role well i don't know how new it is sorry i've just said it, but it's, new, <laughs> it's new to me anyway um that's embarrassing but what is what's that new belief or behavior that's really had an impact on your work life in the last five years or so so i um had uh my first baby eight years ago and i've now got four children um which is a lot of children so i've got an eight-year-old a five-year-old uh 21 month old and a six month old because covid caught me kind of slightly unawares and I had two babies um, during COVID lockdown. Um, and what I've had to do is, you know, as I get more senior and more busy and my personal life gets more busy and I can't kind of work in the evening and through the night is, is getting more efficient at stuff. And I am literally my skills at multitasking and focusing on what's important have been incredibly honed over the last five years. So no longer do I spend any time on anything that is not the absolute you know, will actually drive this business harder. So, um, you know, I run everything by a filter of, will this get us more customers? Will this make the customer experience better? And if it won't do it, it's just maybe a nice thing to have, or, you know, someone else thinks it, it might be necessary. We just don't do it. I'm absolutely ruthless about what I spend my time on. Whereas I think earlier in my career, I was kind of like, well, I spend quite a long time on that. And I spend quite a long time with that. It has to be absolutely, I think when you get to this level, you have to be absolutely efficient with how you spend your time. So that, there's no one who's going to hear that and go, no, no, that's ridiculous. But I really struggle with this, right? So I could get yeah. up every day and go, well, I also have a, a family a quarter the size of yours. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I could go, right, I'm, ju I'm just going to do what's going to grow automated creative, right? That's all I'm going to do. But yet all I would do is hone and repeat the things that I'm already good at and proficient at. Mm. Whereas the opportunity may lie in the murky, blackness of uncertainty and that's yeah. where all of my previous leaps have come from is when i've gone just throw myself into that into the uncertainty and into a lot of time and investment so how do you know how do you know that you're not missing out on some really juicy goodness that could like i don't know mm -hmm. double, double the amount of growth but you wouldn't do it because it's unproven well i have awesome people that i work with at octopus um, and I have awesome people in my life who are interesting and read things and look at things and have ideas. And I'm a human. And I engage with people and 
I'm a consumer and you know um I was I donated some money to Wikipedia the other day because they had their you know their two you know take this two minutes and donate us 50p because you you rinse all our information and you know we need some money off you and it was such an effective process of getting money out of me within about two and a half minutes that I then screenshotted it and sent it to one of my designers and was like this is a really good way of improving you know my, our processes could we look at that for ours um my CEO the other day got an email from a company he had a direct debit with that was such a nice way of putting an email together that he forwarded it to me in my um creative director and said oh could we take some learnings from this and I was like yeah yes what a brilliant idea so I forwarded it to a copywriter and I was like can you have a look at this um so I think you need to be very open to all the things that one sees in the world as a human which can optimize their their work environment um I actually it's funny I had a conversation with my dad a couple of months ago because I, I I don't have an awful lot of time to read a lot of books but when I do read stuff I try to read stuff on like um human psychology and behavioral psychology uh, because actually as a, as a marketer it's about you know I'm creating a product to sell to a human and I need to understand how humans take things and why they make decisions my dad said oh, I've read this really interesting book um, written by an Olympic rower about how you know all the things that he learned um, to win his medal um, and there's all kinds of like business tips in there as well so I, I bought this book on Kindle and, and I downloaded it it's called how to make the boat go faster and I read the first chapter and I realized that I don't want to slag off someone's book here, but it, I mean, I'm sure it's a great book, but actually the title summarised oh, everything enough. that I need to know, right? <laughs> How, does it make the boat go faster? And I'm like, you know, like I'm trying to go my business. Does something that I'm doing make octopus bigger or more effective? And if it doesn't, don't do it. So um, right, so we, we actually had a leadership away day um, a few months ago at Octopus, um, <laughs> a very brief transition where we were able to, and uh, we all kind of shared book ideas. And I literally sent this book around and I was like, don't buy the book. <laughs> have a look at it online read the title think about that and that's all you need to know so um yeah about taking experiences where you can but then we've been ruthlessly effective and um you know turning them into something that's beneficial so i, th I was going to ask you what is your top marketing tip and i think you've already shared it does it or, make the boat go faster uh, yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you're not the um you're, you're not the first guest to to reference that and it's it, yeah. and it's lovely to hear it again because i <laughs> as a personality i will like like think of lots of things and complicate things oh what about this what about what about this but i don't do enough of that i don't do enough of will this make the boat go faster so thank yeah. you for reminding me for that <laughs> so we're going to move on to the shiny new object now and it's quite a long one and it's all marketing jargon should go in room 101 so rebecca why is that your shiny new object and what mm -hmm. are you well, I mean, as I said, I, I, I always struggled a little bit with marketing. And I remember being at um, a dinner some, some years ago with some journalists when I'd been handed a, a message track by the PR agency. And I didn't really understand what this message track was. There was, it was some kind of pyramid on a piece of paper and it had one message at the top and then it had two other messages. So it was like, this is your primary message and these are your secondary messages. And then if someone asks that, you can loop them into this. And if someone asks that and it loops them into this. And I remember sitting there <laughs> holding this, this piece of paper and I'm like, I've got no idea what this means. You know, I know that again, I'm a human and I can talk to some other humans about stuff that's important. And I know there's some things that I shouldn't mention, um, but I just, I don't understand how to follow this. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I was like, maybe I'm just stupid. I'm just not experienced enough as a marketer to understand how I would effectively utilize the mass message track and then I realized over time that actually all that kind of stuff in my opinion is, is bollocks right it actually all it was was like if you sit next to this journalist they might be interested in that but maybe don't talk about that you know and if they do try and bring that up say oh I'm really sorry I can't talk about that and actually I think you know the the joy of marketing which is it, you're going back to the aim of marketing is to make selling superfluous that you create something that's so perfect that people just want to take it with you and it's just about removing all friction from the that experience of taking it from you and, and, and owning that product um that I think that sometimes marketers can kind of get lost with well all the stuff that they pile on top you know with brand pyramids and brand guidelines and message tracks and strategies and you know plans and, and all that kind of thing and it's just something that I almost now have an absolute aversion to so we don't have um, brand guidelines. I don't have brand pyramid or a donut or a house or any of the other things that early in my career seem to be quite important to people. Um, I don't have a you know complex strategy or plan. You know, I'm trying to grow this business by getting more customers and make that experience better for customers. And that, as my North, North Star, works really, really well. I've never needed to do anything differently. And Octopus has moved. So when I joined the business, there was fifty thousand customers. 
we've now got three three million customers in the UK alone, 13 countries, and we're now valued, our market valuation is about $5 billion. We're actually slightly higher than Centrico, which is the business I left um, five years ago. So I'm like, this stuff works, right? This stripping it back to what are you trying to do? You know, creating a product for a human. You don't need all the gubbins that goes with it. Some people like, I suppose some of that gubbins to kind of form up that thinking, but on the whole, I found that actually people just put it as an excuse in the way of actually stripping it back and understanding how you engage with consumers. So I'm really kind of quite, quite passionate about that is it not being a thing we should have do you think that there's a place for it at a a bigger brand so i think you're in an unusual position because you help to find the product and the marketing and i love you keep coming back to this <laughs> point which is like we'll make the product really good and, and make marketing kind of superfluous it's just like if it, it's really easy to onboard and the experience is great the customer service is great then and then i'm going to tell the mates about it and you've got this kind of beautiful virtuous also kind of tech cycle really very f- familiar to a tech product as you describe yourself as a tech business but if uh-huh. you're if you're launching i don't know dove in china or something like that then how how is head office going to articulate um to the the china office i don't know why i've chose china i don't know if i've chose dove but i'm there <laughs> um that without without those donut houses pyramids hexagons whatever they are um i don't when do those things have a role or are they just complete BS? Well, we need to give, so we have a very a basic toolkit that we give countries that we launch in. So we're obviously in the UK, we've also launched in the USA, Germany, Spain, um, Italy, uh, Japan. Um, and so our designers, generally what happens when we launch the countries, I will lend them one of our designers, one of our senior designers to start building out their comms initially. And there's a kind of basic toolkit of logos and a bit of guidance around color palettes and all that kind of thing, um, which they will work with and go, oh, this is our, this is our octopus and this is how you use them. So there's some, some guidance, but actually the whole, it's more like, rather than a set of rules to follow, we have examples that we hope people will lead from. So it's like, you know, our objective is to take cheaper, greener power around the world and grow the business. And we'll go, this is what we found in the UK. This was really useful. This was a good channel to use, you know, um, and here's some some tools that can help rather than having an absolutely rigorous, um, you know, set of you can only do it this way. And I, I remember, it, again, I shouldn't, I don't like to criticize kind of former employees, but I remember it, British Gas spending about three months once when I worked in the brand team, redesigning um, the, um, the business cards. Um, and um, the and the SMT at British Gas at the time, I remember one absolutely pouring over what went back on the back of the business card over and over, go back to the designer, tweak it and everything. And it's like, it's like that stuff just does, that doesn't grow a business, right? You know, it doesn't really matter what your business cards are, stick a logo on them, people will cope with it. Um, it doesn't matter whether the logo is like two millimeters to the left or to the right. And when I look at businesses that I think are disrupting the world, I look at Tesla and I look at Uber and I look at Amazon, um, you know, Netflix, those kind of businesses, very disruptive. And I think they have a vision for what they're trying to achieve. Um, you know, Amazon wanted to be the place to buy stuff from on the Internet. Tesla wants to make the world electric. And um, I'm sure there are some guidelines in there, but I feel that actually, and having worked with some of those businesses, that, that, that what's more important for them is ways of working. So you have the Amazon route, which actually I, I, I pinch octopus as well. When they want to launch a new product, they write a press release first. They understand what the consumer will get at the end of it. Um, you know, Tesla have an interesting model where um, they don't do marketing. They don't do PR. They don't talk about it at all. A lot of stuff kind of comes from Elon. And so I think people, you know, when you say big brands need guidelines, well, I think the big brands that are changing the world do things very, very differently. Um, and I'm not saying look and feel isn't important because it is. Um, but I think they're always challenging what the traditional norms, you know, should be. And I'm playing devil's advocate here because I do agree with you, but just to be annoying because we're doing it because it's Christmas. Um, and other than Tesla, you could argue that they're all services businesses. They're all dot coms. You know, you arrive at the site and there's a you know Amazon's you buy something in one click or you know let Netflix. If you've never been there before, you could be watching some incredible entertainment within a few clicks on any device anywhere. I'm not sure who who else you mentioned. Apple, um, I guess a service business a bit. But what 
I think the, where the argument happens is when you're starting to talk about uh, like FMCG, for example. So if you're like, I'm going to go back to Dove Newlet, you know, if you're trying to make your brand appear different to 25 other products at the point of purchase that is arguably very similar in, in its makeup and what it does, then the subtleties of strategic positioning and how the brand sits in the mind of the consumer is vital because that's all there is. Whereas, mm. yeah, whereas you, you um, I don't, I think it's a very different with FMCG and, and services business potentially. You say that it's interesting though that you talk about Dove because actually, um, um, I wrote in my advertising module at uni, I wrote a paper on Dove and their um, their Real Women campaign, um, which I suppose must have been twenty years ago now because I'm you know cracking on a bit. Um, which is when they were the first beauty brand to use women who weren't models in their advertisement, which is massive and incredibly bold and, you know, brought in a whole new change of um, change of the way that beauty brands looked at, looked their, looked at their advertising. And I wrote this paper on it. Um, and um, because I was a bit of a clever dick, um, I rubbed the paper um, <laughs> that when I submitted it with Dove soap. And then I wrote at the end, like, oh, you know, to the to the, the lecturer, like, you know, I'm trying to use every every touch point as, as a marketer here. So I've rubbed it, you know, so you may have smelt it as you were writing it. And this means you're, you're bound to give me a first because I've thought about all of the senses that I can encapsulate when, when writing this piece. And I did get a first, actually, um, just in my in my advertising right. module. And actually, funny enough, when I went to Ogilvy, actually, Daryl Fielding, who was the head of the account for the Dove piece of work, was uh, was at Ogilvy. So I was, yeah, I used to watch her walk through the building and think, God, oh, wow, she's amazing. Um, in, in terms of thinking that so I think that e even with that kind of SMC brand actually when they you know yeah you might say they might follow some more specific guidelines around visual and packaging and what that looks like on the shelves but actually if you if you redefine categories and think again about you know being a human and selling a product to a human and I don't know whether Daryl was kind of <laughs> where the idea came from but someone was in the shower one day and thinking hang on you know I'm looking at you know, using my shampoo and thinking, why is this always got a supermodel advertising it when actually the normal person promoting, you know, using this product is 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 a kind of slightly dumpy, um, you know, perfectly happy kind of middle aged lady. And why aren't we using those kinds of people as well? It's like actually Ogilvy also did a rebrand on Kotex, which was the first um, period um, uh, product manufacturer to use red in their branding, which was totally, in, uh, you know, Nifma in, in those days as well. Why would you use red when you can use pastels? So it's like even in those more traditional sectors, brands that have made a difference actually really take it back to thinking about humans. You know, it, you know, women have periods and they they bleed and it's red. So why is that not on packaging to kind of like, you know, be like we're women talking to women, you know, or people who bleed, um, and um, and and you know, driving that cut through from human to human. So yeah. It always works. Well, we've covered some real ground here and I've thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Um, but unfortunately, we are at time. So, Rebecca, how would you like people to get in touch with you? Oh, um, I have um, an email address, which is rds at octopus.energy, because my name's quite long and complicated. So rds at octopus.energy. If anyone's interested in saying hello, I'm always interested in talking to interesting people. Um, you know, with the same kind of views as me, so please do get in touch. And what makes a really good email? What makes a really good email? Think about who's receiving it. Um, so, uh, you know, no kind of like, oh, I've been thinking a lot about my career um, and I'm quite interested in octopus and could I have an hour of your time so you can give me advice on where I could do next? Because I'm like, that's not really, you know, beneficial to me. I think if you go, I'm awesome and I've done all of this and I think I should could grow your business, then that's more interesting. So think about your, your end user. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely way to finish it Rebecca thank you so much for your time and have a great Christmas and you thank you so much for inviting me